It's funny. Uh, so, yeah, stand with me for the reading of the word, if you would. While you're finding it, I'll just tell you I had, a, had lunch with a good friend of mine yesterday. And, uh, or excuse me, Friday, and he's a pastor in Owensboro. We grew up together, and, and uh, we're talking, and it's like we have so much in common with the vision that God's given us, you know, in, in our church. And they're getting ready to start, or actually they just started a Sunday night service, which we're going to do in October. Uh, so many things were similar. And then it, I said, uh, we were talking about Sunday. I said, I've got to go do some sermon prep. And uh, I said, hey, what are you preaching Sunday? He goes, well, I'm preaching through the book of Matthew right now. And I said, no way. I said, what chapter are you on? He said, chapter 8. I said, okay, I'm, I'm in front of you. So we're in this kind of race now. <laughs> but there you go. So Matthew, this is part 45, and we're in chapter 12. How about that? <laughs> Moving along. What you take? So Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37. You have it? I need to take a swig real quick. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 33. <clears throat> Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Now, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees, and he says, You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, the good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. This is the word of the Lord, and you may be seated. Years ago, I, I used to wrestle with this question, am I a true Christian? Like, I grew up in the church, like many of you. I, I, I knew how to read uh, my Bible. I speak Christ, Christianese, right? I knew all the, the churchy words. But I just wondered, particularly in my young adult years, have I just been playing church? Is this faith really mine? And I think that's a, a question that we can all relate to. You've probably wrestled with that at some point in your Christian life. And the good news is this, is that we're not the first generation to struggle with this, to wrestle with this question. As a matter of fact, if you uh, were, are to ever read the book of First John... Uh, not John the Gospel, but John's first epistle, you will find that that book is dedicated to uh, let Christians know how they can be sure that they are really saved. And it serves also as a warning to those who might be quote-unquote playing church. And so I believe God wants us to have assurance of our salvation. Amen? So today's text addresses what we might call the evidence of true faith. Now, we all know, right, that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. Are we in agreement there? Not saved by works, we're saved by grace. But the question that I want to address today is, how can we know that our faith is genuine? Lots of people claim to have faith in God, right? How can we know our faith is genuine? The Bible teaches that true believers have a heart that loves God and is bent towards His will. Okay? So to be a Christian, if your faith is real, you've got this heart that is pure and loves God. Now in the Bible, the heart is not uh, the, the blood pumping organ in your body. I think you know that. But it is the core of who you are. It's, it's the, the deepest, most spiritual part of our being. That's what the Bible means when it talks about the heart. And did you know the Bible mentions the heart almost 1,000 times? Do you think God's trying to perhaps get something across to us? We've seen throughout the book of Matthew 
that God looks at the heart, not just at what we do, but he looks at the heart. The Pharisees, these religious leaders, they have kept a slew of religious traditions in their attempt to kind of earn their way to God and bolster their own self-righteousness. But you remember in the Sermon on the Mount how Jesus just kept bringing them to the fact that They might be keeping some rules, but they're still breaking the spirit of the law because their hearts are not right. So a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the previous passage here in Matthew where Jesus delivers and heals a a, a man who was bound by a demon. Remember, he was blind and mute and Jesus cast out the demon, wonderfully healed the man so that he could speak and see. And instead of celebrating this life-changing event with the crowd, what did the Pharisees do? They accused Jesus that he cast out the demon by Satan. There's always got to be somebody in every group, right? That's got to rain on the parade. Come on. Somebody may be sitting in your row right now and you're giving them the eye. Come on, that's you. You always got to be negative, right? But the Pharisees have the audacity to see the wonderful things that Jesus has done and say, you are empowered by Satan. And Jesus then talks about what we call the unpardonable sin, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. A couple of weeks ago, I was thinking through this text and, and you know, over the last few months, uh, we've been entertained by this uh, Depp versus Heard trial, right? You never thought you'd heard this, you would hear this talked about in church. And so a couple weeks ago, I was thinking through this passage and this came to mind because, um, as you know, Amber Heard had attempted to ruin her ex-husband Johnny Depp's reputation. Who's with me? Do you see this? All right. So Depp, what did he do? He, he took her to court for allegations of uh, defamation of character, right? And then heard countersued. So in the end, Depp was awarded, uh, Depp was awarded about, what, $10 million, something like this, and heard some $2 million. But the, uh, the interesting thing is this. Heard's intent, it seems to me, in all of this, was to make her ex-husband look crazy and insane and a horrible person. But she is the one who came out, according to social media at least, she's the one who came out looking like an absolute lunatic. Isn't it funny how that happens? So to be sure, I am not comparing Jesus to Johnny Depp, all right? (laughs) But I do think we find a similar situation in our text today. The Pharisees have attempted to make Jesus look out of his mind evil, right? Who's with me? But it turns out here... They're they're messing with the wrong guy, right? Jesus reveals that they are the ones who are evil. He shows the true intent of their hearts. The Pharisees are the ones who come out of the situation looking like fools. So the question I want to address today is this. With all that being said, how do we know that we have the right heart? What, what evidence is there that our heart is pure and of God? Well, number one is this, or this, actually, this is it. This is the main point. A right heart bears the right fruit. A right heart will bear the right fruit. Look at verse 33 of our text. Jesus says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. We have a tree out here to my left, uh, uh, right in the grassy area to to the left of me outside. How do you know what kind of tree that is? It's a fruit tree. How do you know that? It produces peaches, that's right. You guys are so smart. (laughs) Yeah, so that's the... I think this is the point. An apple tree produces apples. A a peach tree, peaches. A healthy tree produces healthy fruit. It's funny that I'm looking at my notes as if I need that to clarify this to you. But um, (laughs) Jesus has been going around proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Think of this. 
He's been caring like you do, church, for the most marginalized of people. He cares about the homeless. He cares about the sick, the ones who have been cast out. He's been pouring out his love on crowds of people, healing them, delivering them. And through his actions, what has he shown? He's demonstrated that he has both the power of God and the heart of God. Because how many know this is God's heart right here? This is God's heart. The Pharisees, on the other hand, who claim to be righteous, come on, they're the churchy people. They've got the three-piece suits on. They know all the Christianese language. And they're on the soapbox. You know the type. They're the ones who claim to be righteous, yet, here's the issue, they fail to bear spiritual fruit. The Pharisees look good sometimes, but Jesus has revealed their hearts. Listen, remember uh, in, in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about the Pharisees who, they, they like to pray. And you go, oh, that sounds really spiritual. Well, the problem is they like to pray not for the glory of God and the good of others, but they like to pray for men's applause. They used big words and long phrases to try to make themselves look more spiritual than they actually were. In Matthew 9, remember that Jesus had a dinner party and he, he, he invited, he, he partied with the tax collectors and sinners. People who the Pharisees would not be caught dead with. Think about it. They threw a fit and they accused Jesus. Who is this that dines with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus quoted to them their, old, old, their, their own Old Testament that God desires mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus was showing mercy. The Pharisees were not. Jesus was bearing fruit. The Pharisees were not. You get what I'm saying We all know people who consider themselves extremely religious. But they're mean as snakes sometimes. They're cynical. They're angry all the time. They're hateful. And can I just say to you this morning that it is possible to be religious and have a heart that's far from God. It really is. Now, there are two types of fruit in particular that reveal the condition of our hearts. Namely, here's, here's the two, two types of fruit we want to look for. Words and actions. It's real simple this morning. Words and actions. So let's go to verses 34 and 35. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, did you get that? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out of here reveals what is in here. The good person out of his good treasures brings forth good. The evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Folks, the point is really clear here. Words are really revealing as to what's going on in the heart. Now, I think this is important to say, anybody can say nice things. Are you with me? You can fake it. You, can, you, you, know, you know how to talk churchy. You may not be churchy at all, quote unquote, but you know how to talk church lingo, right? Anybody can say nice things, but hang around them long enough, and the words that come out of their mouth will reveal what's really in their heart. Spend enough time with someone who's overcome with lust, and eventually you're going to hear crude jokes and off-color comments come out of their mouth. Hang out long enough with a person who has hatred in his heart. And eventually you're going to see him blow up and speak evil against people. Gossip. Get to know someone well enough who has a prideful heart. And eventually you're going to hear them toot their own horn to where it drives you crazy. And they'll put themselves above other people. What's in the heart, friends, it's going to eventually come out, for better or for worse. I want you to think about something. Think about a spouse. If you're not married, think about a friend. It Does, doesn't matter. Some relationship. Now, you can sing your spouse's praise, right? 
most of the time. You can go on Facebook and people often do say, oh, I've got the best spouse, I've got the best friend, I've got whatever. Uh, I, I love, you know, I love when married people paint the picture like everything is beautiful. And I'm, I'm warning single people who want to get married, don't believe what you see on Facebook. Like marriage is awesome, but can I get a witness, somebody? All right, there you go. So <laughs> moving on. So you can post on Facebook how wonderful your, your spouse is, and you can go on like there's no issues, and you can lo- be all lovey-dovey with your spouse. But here's the deal. Eventually, in, in any relationship, you're going to have a, a moment of intense Christian fellowship. We, we don't call it arguing. It's, it's a moments of intense Christian fellowship. So Levi, if you put up that next slide, here, here's what happens though. You have it a moment. Th- these folks just had that moment, right? Intense Christian fellowship. And sometimes one person or the other tends to blow off, bl- blow up and spew words that are pretty ugly. We've probably all done that at some point in our lives, right? And then you might say to your spouse after a moment like that, hey, I'm sorry I didn't mean it. But, you, but we all know this. You can say that, but what's deep down in your heart, maybe things that you didn't even, frustrations you didn't even know you had with your spouse, those things come out. And so you and your spouse know, hey, you may have not meant to say it in this way. It may have been harsher than you intended. But your words were really revealing that you've been holding some frustrations with me down in your heart. Our words matter and our words are revealing. A person with a heart that is not right will use words inconsistently. The Pharisees, here's what's odd. The Pharisees out of one side of their mouth, they were always blessing God. Quoting scripture, declaring their love for God. But think of it, out of the other side of their mouth, they're, bl- they're cursing his Messiah. They bless God with their words and then they curse others with their tongue. Uh, how many have ever read James, the book of James? Like, you talk about a convicting book. He will get in your business. So chapter 3 is about the tongue, and it's about the revelatory nature of the tongue and uh, the almost uh, impossible task of taming the tongue. It's only with God that we can control our our tongue, right? So let me just read you an excerpt from this. This will be on the screen, James 3, 9 through 12. With it, the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people from who we are made in the likeness of God. And listen to this, from the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Now just think about this. If you've been in church any time, and let's say you have one of those quote-unquote Holy Ghost services, right? And you see sister so-and-so, she can pray, and she's got a prayer language, and, and she's, you, you know, oh, you're like, oh, man, she's just, she's feeling the Lord right now. But then you just happen to be in the parking lot as she's walking out. In the same mouth that she was praising God with, you hear her complaining and grumbling about the sermon or cursing out her husband or whatever, and you go, wait, this makes no sense. And that's what James is saying. Guys, out of one side you're blessing God and out of the other uh, of your mouth you're blessing God. Out of the other you're cursing. Man, this should not be. There shouldn't be an inconsistency in our speech. And guys, listen, we ought to guard our words. This is convicting to me. I'm a preacher. I like to talk. It's true. Darren Hardy, a leadership guru, he said this, quote, I think we've got this... On the slide, this is a great quote. We must be careful with our words. We are like superheroes, and words are like superpowers. Superpowers should always be used to help others. Don't you feel encouraged today? Your pastor called you superheroes. Think about that. Our words are powerful. And so James is saying, listen, if you're blessing God, great, but make sure you bless other people with your words as well. I once worked for someone who continually claimed their love for God. And he, 
Again, he had the Christian lingo down, and you would think, man, this guy, whew, he is hyper spiritual. This man must like hear Jesus' audible voice every night. But it didn't take long to discover how horribly he spoke about other Christians. Mean, ugly. And that kind of inconsistency in speech, friends, it, it reveals a heart that's not right. One of the things that's blowing me away right now as we think about what we're saying is how many people who claim a love for God are speaking words that condone things that God hates. It's happening in America right now. There are cultural narratives that are being pushed that are extremely sinful. And yet some quote-unquote cool Christians are getting on the bandwagon and saying, Oh, you know what? Not only are they accepting these things, they're celebrating them. Do you see the inconsistency here? Uh, Isaiah warns of this in, in chapter 5 verse 20. Woe to you who call good evil and evil good. That's exactly what's happening in our culture right now. All of us, I think it's important to say, all of us have said things, right, that we're not proud of. That's everyone in here. You've probably this week said something that you regret. And so I just want you to know this. I'm not suggesting that if you slip and say something impure or ugly to someone or you have a really weak moment and you lose your temper. I'm not, I'm not saying that you're not saved. Understand that. Here's what I mean. If that is a regular pattern in your life to where your words are just constantly ugly and, you know, you, you get what I'm saying. I think that should give you reason to pause. Because what's in your heart is going to eventually flow out. It's, it's, it's a good test to see how the heart really is. What, what kind of state the heart is in. All right? So our words testify to the conditions of our heart. And there's one other spiritual fruit that I want to mention here that reveals a person's heart. And that is our actions. So we've got our words and then we've got our actions. Look at verse 35 with me. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. So in the context of the passage, the focus of bringing forth good or evil is, is the, the focus is really around our words. I want to be true to the text. But the Bible often connects spiritual fruit with our actions. You've seen this in the scriptures, right? Let me just read you uh, a text. John chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. Look at this. Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you. So you can't bear fruit unless you abide in Jesus. He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him... He it is that bears much fruit. Now listen to this. For apart from me, you can do nothing. What does that mean? Like you literally can't do anything apart from Jesus? It, what it means is you can't do anything of spiritual value apart from Jesus. You cannot bear this spiritual fruit that we're talking about. So positively, when, when Jesus talks about bearing fruit, it means someone who does the good works of the kingdom. Someone who is working to advance the kingdom. That, that person shows that he or she is connected to Jesus Christ. Because if the root's right, the fruit's right. Negatively, someone who claims to be a Christian, who acts, whose actions do not bear spiritual fruit, they show they do not belong to Christ. Because the root obviously is not right if they're not bearing the right fruit. Let me read you a really sobering passage from the book of 1 John chapter 3. Look up here at the screen with me. You know that he, Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins. You guys know that, right? And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Now, let's pause because you're going, what? I sinned this week. Oh my gosh, you know, right? I've never seen God or known God. When you look at the Greek, this is in the present act of participle, which means the wording. Put, put that back up for me, Levi, please. Um, what that means is, it should read like this. Those who go on kind of habitually sinning. 
This is someone who walks in unrepentant sin, who just lives the same way they used to. And here's what he says, that person, uh, no one who keeps on sinning has either seen Jesus or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Those are sobering words. Folks, if somebody claims to love Jesus, to, be, to, to have, say, say, hey, they come to you and say, hey, listen, I got, quote, unquote, saved in church today. Man, I gave my heart to the Lord, but they have zero life change. Reason for pause. Because Jesus gives us the power over sin. Do we still stumble? Absolutely. But we should not go on in the same pattern of life like we used to live. Everybody understand that? I saw a great Facebook post yesterday. It says this, quote, Christianity is not a Bible verse tattooed on your arm. Christianity is not a cute Hillsong lyric. Or to be fair, a hymn. (laughs) Christianity is not online in your Instagram bio. Christianity is actively dying to yourself and living for Christ. That's what faith looks like. That's what a pure heart looks like. It's a heart that desires to serve God. The life of a true Christian will be marked by a love for Jesus that is demonstrated by the spiritual fruit of pure words, good works, and a hatred for sin. Every time I preach, here's my goal, beloved. beloved. My goal is this. To make you love Jesus more and to hate sin more. That's the goal. That's what I hope happens today. So you might argue, Pastor, I thought you said that we are saved by grace. Because this sounds like salvation by works. It's not salvation by works. We are saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Works are not the means of salvation. Words are not the means of salvation. But listen, they are the evidence of salvation. Martin Luther said this. He said, we are saved by faith alone. But the faith that saves is what? Never alone. Let me just read that one more time. We are saved by faith alone. But the faith that saves is never alone. So if you claim to have faith, and this is the point of the book of James. If you claim to have faith, but your life is not congruent with that faith, there's an issue. You've got dead faith. And and what James says is there are demons who hell who have faith and that they know that Jesus is Lord and they tremble. In other words, if you have that kind of Faith, where you know what you say, I believe in God. If if that's as far as it goes, you have demonic faith. You're you're on the level with the demons. They believe in God and they tremble. But true faith is what it looks like. Saving faith is to repent, to turn to Christ, to believe in His finished work for your salvation, and to profess Him as Lord of your life. Which means, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to serve you. That's what saving faith looks like. And during his earthly ministry, Jesus demonstrated by his words and his works that he was of God. And beloved, listen, as true Christians whose hearts have been changed by the gospel, we ought to be bearing spiritual fruit like Jesus. Let me just mention before I close here. The deceitfulness of a hardened heart. The deceitfulness of a hardened heart. If I can get your attention for just five more minutes. This is something I've wrestled with. It seems to me that the Pharisees, particularly in this chapter, I think they're convinced that Jesus is actually of the devil. I don't think they're just lying here. Which is really odd. Because he's doing the works of God. And I think this is tragic because what I think has happened is the Pharisees are so self-righteous that they see themselves as not needing a Savior. Have you known anybody like that? Like, oh, the drug addict, you know, he, he needs a Savior, but me? 
Come on, folks. We all need a Savior. There are none righteous, no, not one. So it seems to me that the Pharisees really, that their hearts were so hardened by their own self-righteousness that they really thought they had pure hearts, that they really thought they were hearing from God. And in, in being in that state, they actually missed the Messiah that they had been waiting for for centuries. That Messiah was in front of them doing miracles, doing the work of God, and they missed him because of a hardness of heart. So here's my point. Friends, you can be in church and think, oh, I've gone to church my whole life. You know, I read my Bible. I, I mark it up. I take copious notes. Whatever. But yet you can have a heart of stone and not even know it. Because you're so out of tune with God. You are so, in, you, you are, you're deceived. The heart is deceitful. Above all things. The the non-Christian heart is deceitful above all things. So your heart's aim is to deceive you. The enemy wants to deceive you into thinking, hey, I'm all right. And my point today, I'm not a fire and brimstone preacher. My, My point today is not to make true Christians doubt their salvation. But my point today is say to those of you who are living like everybody else, who are doing what continually what you know you ought not to do, who are saying things that you know uh, and you know that, that these things are not godly, at least pause this morning and say, am I really a true believer? Do I have the right heart? Come on up, sir. Are your words and actions consistent with who you claim to be? Just pause for a moment. Really think about this. Are your words and actions consistent with who you claim to be, who you want to be? Last week, I read a a heartwarming story, a beautiful story of a girl. Her name is uh, Abby Wardell. She was born with a defective heart. Her first open heart surgery, get this, her first open heart surgery was before her first birthday. All the way up to the time when she was 11 years old, she was in and out of the hospital, seeing multiple doctors and surgeons, so on and so forth. But her heart continued to decline. When she was 11 years old, the doctors came to her and said, listen, came to her parents and said, your daughter has to have a transplant. Her her heart, listen to this, was functioning at 13%. She's 11 years old. The only, he said, we've done all we can do, this doctor. The only way she's going to live is to get a new heart. And by God's grace, Just a short time later, they found a donor, and she was given a new heart. She was interviewed in in the newspapers as well as her parents, and she said, when this new heart was given to me, and after I healed from surgery, she said, I never thought I could feel this good. She said, I had energy like I I never imagined I could have. Because your heart is, you know, malfunctioning your entire life. You don't have energy. She said, I never thought I could feel this good. And then she said, words cannot express how thankful I am for the heart that I received. I'm grateful to the family. Thank you. I'm grateful to the donor. Thank you. And her parents said, There are no words that can adequately express our gratitude for this gift. Listen to me. Amber could not do anything to fix her own heart. No other human being could repair her heart. If she was going to have a right heart, a heart that functioned properly, Amber was going to have to be given a new one. 
And I say, I tell you that story to say this. Some of you are trying to make your heart good. (laughs) But the heart is deceitful. It is wicked apart from Jesus. You can't make your heart right. I don't care how much Bible you read, how much church you attend. There's one way to get the right heart. And it's to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the donor had to die in that story. That the donor had to die in order to give that heart to this young girl. Friends, the King of Kings died intentionally to give you your new heart. It's part of the package that we get in salvation. You can go back to the book of Ezekiel. And the prophet is talking about the new covenant that will come through the Messiah. And and God says through the prophet, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put in you. And I'll remove, what's he say, the heart of stone and I'll put within you a heart of flesh. It's the Lord that gives us new hearts. And so today, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're trying to clean yourself up, listen, today I tell you, you can't do it. Come to the altar today. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The one who died was buried and rose again on your behalf. And he will take that heart of stone and he will give you a heart that's soft and sensitive to the things of God. If you are here and you are a Christian, you know you have a right heart, celebrate that assurance that you have today. Celebrate that assurance and let's rejoice in what Christ has done for us. May our words and our actions reflect hearts that are owned by God, hearts that are sensitive to the Holy Spirit, hearts that love God and people above all things. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we love you. We thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you for sending Jesus to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. God, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you would move upon us today, God. Speak to our hearts. Let us hear you. Let us be able to, by your spirit, to evaluate where we are with you. For those who are truly safe today, oh, Lord, may they sense your assurance. And may the fruit of their lives reflect that salvation. But for those of the, today that who have perhaps professed you, said to you, Lord, Lord, but live inconsistent lives, may they pause today. May by your grace, your kindness, lead them to repentance this day. Help us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' good name, amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing and prepare our hearts for communion.